I want to make up for my absence. So we're not doing verse by verse today. I'm going to give you a very great teaching. And I think you know uh, your favorite subject that you like for me to teach about is prayer, right? Yeah. I want to make it up. Let's talk about prayer. Amen. All right. Now, how does that match the title, right? So when we pray to the Lord, we hear so many accounts and stories about people who prayed, George Mueller, other prayer heroes and warriors of faith. They believed what they were praying for. And they believed that exactly what they prayed for, they were going to get it, that God would say yes to their request. So these men would pray fervently, they would pray hard, and they would never give up, and they would have like undeniable faith, miraculous faith in impossible requests, and God just mightily answered it. So it's incredibly amazing, and we would wonder, why do they have it, why don't we have it? So then we would pray in faith, and we would try our best to put everything we can into the prayers, but let's be honest, God doesn't answer all the time. So then we, there are people who get discouraged about that, and we wonder, is there something wrong with me? Well, usually when you talk about the power of prayer, you would think mighty fruits that came out of it, results, and basically how God answered yes, and then gave the miracles. But I would beg to differ that that's not the power of prayer. You might say, what do you mean by that? It, when God says yes to your prayers, yes, that is part of the power of prayer. But that's not the holistic perspective. The power of prayer is how God answers. I would like to talk about the power of no. I think this might be an incredible blessing for people who need this in their prayers. Okay, let's start it off right here. We're going to look at Romans, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. The first thing we have to think about is that we know in prayer... We have to pray according to God's will. If we pray according to God's will, then he will answer that. Now, I've shown you verses on that, and I've done teachings on that before in prayer, so I won't do that right here. For those of you who don't know, I would strongly recommend to go to our YouTube playlist and find School of Prayer. Click on that playlist and watch those videos. It will be incredibly helpful. A lot of what I'm going to teach in this teaching is from those videos. Okay, so from those older videos, I'm not going to repeat them. I'm just going to skim through them and then continue on with this teaching about the power of no, because you need to hear something new. But we have to understand this. Didn't you realize that even though you pray according to God's will, and even if it is God's will, that God will still say no? Now, you might say, when you first hear that, you might think that sounds a little bit blasphemous, but no, I'm going to actually show you something so convincing from Scripture that you will have to agree with me later. Okay, so just put up with me right now. So don't walk out of church, brother. I know, okay, I'm glad you said, okay, don't walk out of church yet, all right, brother? So just put up with this one a little bit, all right? And then you'll find out a little later. First of all, we have to understand this. When we give requests to the Lord, think about this. Isn't it God's will that he wants every single person to be saved? Yeah, that's God's will. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Uh, skip down, not willing that what? Any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But guess what? Not every soul that you pray for does get saved. Not every soul, which is very sad. Uh, isn't it God's will? Sure, it's his will. But let's be honest, from the reality stated from Scripture, not everyone, not everyone gets saved. And that's the first thing you got to realize is that when you pray to the Lord, he's going to say no. Why? Based on these factors below. One is the reality of sin and free will. The reality of sin and free will. 
Let's look at another example. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. There's a loved one who is dying or very ill and sick. So we pray for people to be healed, right? Uh, there are people who unfortunately, though, do die. There are persecutions, even, from enemies or people attacking you, some dangerous situations that come up, and you're praying for God's protection, right? So we understand that, but look at Genesis chapter 6. When bad things, tragic situations happen in our world, the Bible says that Genesis chapter 6 and verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The earth, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. So notice that there's so much corruption. There are tragic situations that are happening. But look at verse, this is amazing, at verse 6. And it what? Repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Wow, look at that. There was something that God definitely had a change of mind on. His will. His will was that he doesn't want sin and tragedy in the world. Right? He doesn't want that. That's pretty obvious from Genesis 6, 6, and then uh, 12 and 13. But guess what? That don't stop it, right? Doesn't corruption still continue? Crime happens. Guess what? Murder will still happen. Kidnapping will still happen. Stealing still happens. Unfair situations happen. You can pray as much as you want, but guess what? It's not going to change that fact. Even though God's will is behind your prayer that I don't want these bad things to happen, well, then why don't you answer? Well, let's be honest. Notice from the scripture, it still does happen. Here's another one. Let's look at Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. So tragic situations happen. And God's will is in that. He doesn't want tragic situations to happen. But guess what? They still happen. Look at Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. So just because you pray everything according to God's will, it doesn't mean it has to be answered because guess what? God's will is no crime, no sin. But it still happens. God's will is every soul gets saved. But guess what? A lot of souls still die and burn in hell. Now let's look at Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. And then we'll read verse 35. Verse 35. The word of God reads, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither what? came into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Notice right here that it is certainly not in God's will, neither even popped up into his mind about the specific dirty, wicked, evil things that these Jews were doing. They were sacrificing babies. That's a horrible thing. So we have to understand the reality of sin and the free will of man. Man has a free choice, so God's not going to be a Calvinist. Change their desire and will to every whim that he wants it to be done. He doesn't force them. We have to understand the reality of sin and free will in these cases. If we understand this fact, let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I'm going to pour a lot of scriptures on this point right here. The reality of sin and free will. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. Notice that humans have free will. So God, when he wants to answer your prayer, Lord, I want my prodigal child to come back home. The Lord, he can't do it where he changes their free will. Yeah. Is it possible that their free will can resist can resist Absolutely. the conviction of the Holy Spirit and God's will, desire for them. Yes, it, they can. There are verses on that one. Acts chapter 7 is one example. 
So even though your prayer is into that and the will of God is following a line with that, that person can res still resist against that. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Notice that the word of God reads at verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a what? Willing. Willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. Notice right here that this, it's up to this individual to get right with God. God doesn't force something to happen. Here's another one. Let's look at... Uh, Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, why is there starvation? Why is there famine? Why is it that when I pray for God's protection and then for God to take care of this individual, that individual, that Lord just allows these bad things to happen, He don't do anything about it. So that's why people have a tendency, and sadly, I hope that's not some of you, but some of them could have fallen trap into this when they would pray and God doesn't answer. Then the only person they can blame is God. But no, you can't blame God. You have to blame what? The reality of sin and the free will of man. That's the blame, and it's not God, because God's will is that none of these bad things would happen, and His will is aligned with your prayer, and He wants to answer it. But he can't go against the reality of sin and free will. Sin has to be, when you sow it, it has to be reaped. Corruption has to be reaped from sin. That's why all these bad things have to happen. It's reality. Galatians 6, 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh, what? Reap corruption. It must be done. It must be done. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There are people who pray for revival, and you hear these prayer warriors about praying for revival, praying for revival, and actually God did mightily answer their prayers, and then He moved in such amazing ways. And then these prayer warriors would preach against the people, you haven't prayed for revival, that's why there's no revival. Now, I believe that is true with our current day and situation, that's why we have no revival. However, I'm... The, I'm only giving you a partial picture here from their statement. I have to give you the full picture. The full picture is this, is yes, that is true, but it is also true that no matter how much you pray for revival, that the world will still fall into apostasy. The people will still fall into apostasy, apostatize sin and mess up. Why? Because of the reality of sin and free will. God don't go against that. And by the way, it's inevitable. Notice the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 3, apostasy has to. It has to happen. See, no matter how much you might want to pray about that. The Bible says, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a what? Falling away first. Falling away first. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3. Lord, please protect me from this evil and this bad situation and this danger. So we pray about these things, but not all the time does it get answered. And you have to understand that that's not something that you have to get bitter and mad against God. It's just the reality of sin and free will. Because no matter how much you pray... Guess what? You still have to face some sort of harm, attack, or persecution if you live godly. You have to. You can't just pray it all away, no matter how much faith or no matter how much prayer you do that. Because it's inevitable. You have to face something bad one day. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, what? Shall suffer persecution. All right, Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Notice right here, you can pray for souls to get saved as much as you want to, and God's will may be behind it, and you might have fasted, and then you might have put a lot of faith into it, and you prayed according to God's will, and you lived a clean life, 
and then God's behind it. But no matter how much is done, you can't change the free will of man or the reality of sin because it is stated by Scripture. Amen. You can't change that. So why do you get discouraged so easily and get a guilt trip? I want you to be delivered from that. I don't want you to think that you're doing something wrong. Right. I want you to think that no matter how much you do everything right, and by the way, God did everything right with your prayer too. He didn't do anything wrong. But guess what? Still no answer. Isn't that amazing? God did everything right too. And still mankind says, no God. No matter how much God works on their heart or convicts them or works up situations for them to get saved. They can resist it. Look at Matthew chapter 7. You can pray for souls to get saved, but look at this. The majority still have to burn in hell. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and what? Many there be which go in thereat. See? Billions still die and burn in hell. God's will is not behind it, but that's reality of yeah, sin. That's right, brother. Reality of sin and free will. So that's the reason why God won't answer, is because it's not your fault. You have to understand that. And it's not God's fault. The danger of praying so much in faith for a yes answer leads to bitterness and guilt trip and discouragement. And you don't blame yourself and you don't blame God. You have to realize the blame is on sin and the free choice of man. When you do that, it's going to help you more. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 3. And then we'll read verse 23 through 26. Another thing you have to understand, if God answers yes all the time to your prayer, especially with your past history of how you lived, with your sin, I mean, imagine there are, you have to understand this, there are Christians out there who live like the devil, and they deserve a big spanking sometimes. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes, yeah, a lot of, I'm sure everyone can pretty much agree with that. Sometimes you're like, man, God just needs to whoop them so that they can get their eyes open, right? But what if God answered that person who deserves a spanking? What if God answered their prayer request all the time? If that happens, they don't get their deserving. You know why God answers no? It's simple. You deserve it. If he answered yes all the time, you'd be, you'd be encouraged to keep backsliding, living like the devil, and then maybe you'll never learn your lesson. If you want your prayer to get answered, God's saying, then fix this first child, and then maybe he can start answering your prayers, right? What if, oh, well, I don't like that uh, because I deserve it. That's so discouraging. No, that should motivate you and convict you. It's not about being encouraged, comforted, or discouraged. That's not the issue. The issue is that should convict you and that should motivate you. You might say, well, I don't like that. Then do you want God to answer your prayers? When God keeps answering your prayers, when you didn't get some things right with the Lord, guess what? You're in a more serious pain, you have to realize. You're in more serious trouble, you have to realize. Because you're going to live in that kind of dependency and that ungrateful attitude like it's given and like it's granted and that, hey, I can do whatever I want and then you just cause more harm than good to yourself. That's why people who get money, rich, or a lot of easy access to sin, what are they encouraged to do? To keep up with that lifestyle, to do those things. But if you put punishment, preventions in there, it prevents them from doing so, right? Why do you think we have laws in this country? They put laws, they put no, they put some kind of fear or punishment in there. Why? So that you don't do it. If God never did that, it'd be chaos. If the government didn't do that, it'd be chaos. That's why the current government is in chaos. Why? Because that's what they've done. That's what they've done. 
with how they disrespected the police force and then how they've done to encourage these uh, chaotic, unpeaceful protests. Here's another one. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 23 through 26. Notice Moses. God rejected Moses' prayer. The, this was the prayer warrior that you'd look up in the scripture. You know that? But God actually said no to this prayer warrior right here. Look at right here. And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, verse 24 now, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth? Notice he knew all the prayer secrets, how to pray. Yeah. If you watch my previous videos, you notice some of those nuggets in the way Moses prayed. That can do according to thy works and according to thy might. I pray thee. Let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. Did that prayer secret work? But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Wow, amazing, right? Moses read all the George Mueller books and the Praying Hyde books and knew all the scriptural passages and then the way to persuade God. He focused on God's glory right here. He focused on his humility right here. He did all the prayer secrets and God says, no, shut up. That's what he basically said right there. He said, no, just shut up. That's right. Why? Because Moses deserved it. So that's another thing you have to understand. And that's good. You do deserve it. You have to realize that. Otherwise you won't change if God doesn't answer your prayer, you have to ask yourself, is there something wrong with me? Yeah. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, hearing this, sounds like gloom and doom, and it's like, well, it's so discouraging. Uh, what can I do? I don't like what I'm hearing today. Well, I, one, you have to understand, yes, I'm glad you understand that. So then, why don't you be more responsible with your free choices, huh? Why don't you understand sin is so serious that you have to preach hard against that instead of saying this is so legalistic, huh? Yeah. All right, if you, don't, if you don't like what you're hearing today right now about this glo uh, gloom and doom stuff, good. You should hate it. You should not like it. Then do this responsibly. Now, this must be understood in David's scenario. David, look at him. He was known as a man after God's own heart, right? We know that one. He was a man after God's own heart. But look at 1 Samuel chapter 12, excuse me, not 8, 12. Chapter 12. Uh, second. Why did I put first? Second. Okay, Second Samuel. 12. 2 Samuel 12. I was definitely asleep on this one. As usual, I didn't get much sleep, actually. I don't know why. Maybe it's because, oh, I'm so nervous to go back to church again and, and to be online, you know. Oh, I'm so scared, you know. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Notice at verse 16. Now, we know David, he's probably one of the best prayer warriors you'll, you'll ever read in the Bible, right? Look at him. Verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted. Oh, he had the power of fasting too. His prayer should definitely get answered. And went in and lay all night upon the earth. Verse 18, and it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Wow, God didn't answer his prayer still. So notice that God did not answer his prayers. David prayed, Lord, save my child's life, but God didn't spare the child. Now, what did David do? This is an important reaction that you want to learn. What should I do, Pastor, if God answers no to my prayer? And I prayed for the prodigal to return. I prayed for that soul to get saved. And I prayed for this tragic scenario, and it still happened. And then I prayed for revival, and then it didn't happen. And what should I do? Well, look at this. Verse 20, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Verse 21, then said his servants unto him, what thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while he was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst ride and eat bread. 
So David, what did he do? (laughs) He replied, this is important. Verse 22. While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. You see that? Guys, look. Now he is dead. 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 dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No. Nothing good comes out of it, see? Nothing good comes out of it. So let me correct the verses right here. Nothing good comes out from just weeping, crying, and being bitter. It's not going to make it good. But... Even though bad things do happen, you don't have to keep it up that way. You can find something else that's good out there. All right, that person didn't get saved, but that other person can get saved, Lord. Will you save that person's soul, Lord? I'm going to keep praying for that other soul. Or maybe, yeah, that person didn't get saved, but in the funeral service, Lord, you can use that one where finally those stubborn family members of mine and more people could get saved. One goes to hell so that maybe 50 others could get saved. So you find something good. That's what you need to do. The prodigal, tragic scenarios you go through, revival, etc. You have to find something else good that you can pray for, that you can have. Don't go back to the past old one that's dead. And you can't get it back. Amen. Let's look at another passage right here. We're going to look at 2 Kings. I don't want people to become discouraged. I want them to understand uh, the importance. I want them to understand the importance of what they can do through the power of prayer. All right? So don't be discouraged. All right, we're going to look at the book of uh, 2 Kings, or was, I think it was 2 Chronicles. All right, sorry. Let me look it up real quickly. Is it 2 Kings? I think you're right, sister. Yeah, 20. It's not 10, it's 20. 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Here's another one right here. Why would God answer no to the prayer requests that you make. And a lot of times you would think, let's be honest, when we pray, we do try to seek God's will when we pray, right? However, to be truly honest, we don't know everything on God's will, do we? So because we don't know everything in God's will, there's going to be times God will say no. And God's will is better than how we would want it. Now, what if God answered every prayer request that you made in life? You know what it would be? It would be a nightmare for you. That's the power of no. Because what you would think would be God's will when it's not actually God's will, and anything that is not of God's will is going to be a worse scenario or something that you wouldn't want. And then if God answered that prayer request of yours that is not according to his will, but what you would think to be God's will, your life would be a flat-footed mess. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 2. So Hezekiah was dying, but he was able to change God's mind and get God to answer his prayer. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 2. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Verse 5. What did God say about Hezekiah at verse 5? He says, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. So Hezekiah was praying really hard. He had that 
prayer secret, that close prayer power with God. And he was even able to have the prayer power that changed God's mind. So what did God do? I have, behold, I will heal thee. So God did heal Hezekiah. Well, that must be a good thing. Actually, it didn't turn out to be a good thing. Hezekiah's sin was not mentioned at all if he died here. You know that? His sin was mentioned after God healed him. He showed the Babylonians his kingdom, which was a foolish thing. And God said, because of that, the, your kingdom is going to be destroyed, not in your time, but in another time. And not only that, he had a son born. Can you switch it to public? Okay, contact Robert and find out what's going on. I don't know if I said something incorrect, you know. I didn't say the word, Brother Robert. I didn't say the word, so I don't know what I did wrong. All right. Maybe it's because of the protest, probably. But anyway, I'll just have to keep teaching. So he had a son born named Manasseh. When Manasseh was born, you know what? That child became the most evil king out of all of the Jewish kings. You know that? Hezekiah had to suffer that kind of record and sorrow. But that was after he got healed. He had a son born. But if he died, he wouldn't have, have gotten such a tragic son like that in the end. Look at 1 Chronicles 4. 1 Chronicles 4. Now, a lot of you have heard the prayer of Jabez. Pastor Donovan, he mentioned this. When people talk about the power of prayer, the person that they turn to, it's not Moses, it's not David. You would think those would be the prayer warriors, but modern churches today, they don't turn to those guys. They all turn to Jabez, the prayer of Jabez. And Pastor Donovan actually said this. He pointed out that the prayer of Jabez is actually a bad example of prayer. It's not a good example of prayer to turn to. But then people will say, but God did answer it. Yeah, of course God answered your prayers that were not his will before. Of course God answered prayer that was fleshly to you before. Why? Because he's a merciful, gracious father. But it's not for your good. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And then notice in verse 9. The Bible says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. Verse 10, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Look how charismatic prosperity gospel this is. Look at this. Thou would bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that, which he requested. But that's not a good example to prayer, Pastor Donovan argues. It's a bad example. Why? It shows feeding the flesh. God answered your prayers before that were fleshly. Let me say it in a better way. You ready for this? Did you ever experience this before? Did you pray for something to God that you wanted so badly, and God answered, and you regretted it? Oh, that never happened to you? Be careful, as a lot of preachers would say, be careful when you get mad at God and get bitter at him. Lord, if you would only do this, but you never did that. And the preachers won't be careful of that attitude because God just might give you what you want. And then you're going to regret it. Now, in Jabez's prayer, there can be some good gleanings here and prayer secrets that we can use. And I, and I do use that. However, it's only a partial picture if I don't show you the negative parts in this prayer too. So in this case, I'm going to only show the negative parts because I'm talking about the power of answered prayers. What's the power here? Yes, in this case. See that? Yes, in this case was a weakness. It wasn't powerful. It should have been a no in this case. The danger of answered prayers. You got to watch out for that. The danger of answered prayers. All right, and that's found at 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I hope that this is, I know that you hear a lot of, uh, it's not positive and nice and prosperity gospel to you, but I hope that you are getting encouraged by this teaching. 
Why? Because you've been discouraged. You've gotten guilt trips on this one. You felt so bad and you've put so much faith into this, but still didn't work out. It privatized again? No, oh, good. Okay, good. All right, then. All right. So then, because of that, all right, y'all pray for this teaching now, all right? <laughs> Devil don't want this taught, all right? So this should encourage you, comfort you, because you put all the faith into it. You fasted, some of you, and then you cried about it, and then now it's turned to a point where you become doubting God's power and becoming a little bitter at Him, right? So this could change your thought pattern in your life. This could help you. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 27. Now, this might be shocking to you, but thank God he answers no. And I put all exclamation points right here. Thank God he answers no. You might say no to that one. Well, I would say no back at you. Thank God he answers no, because why? Because you would have burned in hell right now if God answered this prayer. Look at Matthew chapter 27, uh, 26, excuse me, Matthew chapter 26. Notice what Jesus prayed. He said at verse 42, Jesus, God, who never sins, okay? Oh, he should get answered prayers more than praying, hi, George Mueller and all these prayer wars. He should get his prayers answered. Matthew 26, 42, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Why did Jesus relent that way? Because he knew at the beginning, at verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, he prayed this three times, you have to understand. He prayed fervently, as if sweat were great drops of blood. Now, when you hear these prayer warriors, it would melt your heart. Like uh, David Brainer, when he would pray, it was said that the snow would melt around him when he prayed. One prayer warrior prayed so much in his room that he, his breath basically stained the wall with his prayers when people walked in. John Wesley, when he died... Uh, a person had the privilege to go inside his study room, his prayer room, and just entering inside that room, he already felt an atmosphere of God's power in there because this was where John Wesley prayed. But Jesus Christ had more of a deeper spirit and fervent fervency in his prayers than all those people combined. And guess what? God answered. Not a yes. And thank God. That's thank right. You, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Otherwise, you and I would have burned in hell. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for not answering that prayer, Father, because I would have burned in hell. You and I would not be here today. That's right. you, know, you and I would be on Sunday. You'd, you'd all still be sleeping. You'd all, you know, hang out, do your sinful things or whatever fleshly thing you want to do. That's right, brother. You wouldn't be here today. What are all of you doing here today? Because God answered no to somebody's prayer. Now, what makes you think you're better than Jesus Christ and God should answer yes all the time to you? Look at 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I would like to also say this. Didn't you know if God does not grant your request, that doesn't mean God does not answer your prayer? Now, I know I said throughout at the beginning that God doesn't answer or unanswered prayers because that's how we would take it. When he says no, it's called no answer or unanswered prayer. But in reality, he did answer. He did answer. If God doesn't grant your request, he already gave you an answer. No. When God says no, it's still an answered prayer. Yep. And there is still fruit and power and result that comes out of a no. Just as much as he would say yes, there is fruit and power and result that comes out of it. Didn't you know that? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice uh, what God says to Paul, probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. What did God say to his prayer? <coughs> In verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, 
that it might depart from me. Look, Paul prayed to be healed. Why? So that he, for the ministry's sake, for the glory of God's sake. So he had all the right things to get answered prayers right here. He got all the prayer secrets. But what did God say at verse 9? Here's God's answer. All right? So he does answer. He does answer your prayer, but not a yes. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Did that lack power? No. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the what? Power of Christ may rest upon me. Yes, I would like to teach you today the power of no to your prayers. When you pray to the Lord, why won't this happen, Lord? Then God, he's speaking to you. And some of you know what I'm talking about. He teaches you when you experience later on in life. Probably some, uh, some preaching that came out and then something dawned on your mind. Perhaps when you were reading the Bible and then something popped up at you. Or, like I said, you experienced something in your life and then the Lord just showed you in your mind. I don't know what it is, but God gave you an answer. And when he gave you that answer, it's like the light bulbs went on and then you came to a realization and then you accepted it. And not only that, you, thank, you even thanked God when he said no to your prayer. Thank God for those no. Thank God for your no's. If you don't get no's to the prayer requests, then you'd be a poor, sad soul. I would like to give you, uh, I have a lot of quotes here from prayer warriors, and I'm going to put them in my book, actually, so, uh, because I read so many prayer stuff, but there's not a Bible-believing material that combined all the prayer warriors together. So this will be composed with a lot of scripture and quotes. I'm not going to give you all quotes, but I'm going to give you a couple that I think you'll uh, be blessed by. Oswald Chambers, you know, the one that wrote that book, Utmost for the Highest, said this, It will be a wonderful moment for some of us when we stand before God and find that the prayers were clamored for in early days and imagined were never answered. Have been ans but these prayers that were never answered have been answered in the most amazing way. And that God's silence, listen to this part, God's silence has been the sign of the answer. If we always want to be able to point to something and say, this is the way God answered my prayer, God cannot trust us yet with his silence. Here's another one. Uh, Charles Spurgeon. This is the guy that says, put faith in your prayers and God will answer it with a yes. So hear what he says right here. If the Lord will but hear us, we will leave it to his superior wisdom to decide whether he will answer us or no. It is better for our prayer to be heard than answered. If the Lord were to make an absolute promise to answer all our requests, it might be rather a curse than a blessing, for it would be casting the responsibility of our lives upon ourselves, and we should be placed in a very anxious position. But now the Lord hears our desires, and that is enough. We only wish him to grant them if his infinite wisdom sees that it would be for our good and for his glory. Robert Murray McShine uh, McShine, I think that's how you pronounce it, but he, gave, uh, he was known for his prayers as well. You know what he says? God will either give you what you ask or something far better. F.B. Meyer said this, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Romans chapter 8, and that's why I want you to learn is that that's not the greatest tragedy as I close this teaching. The greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer when you don't pray for it. You might say, why is that? Because those prayers are needful. If you would pray those requests, it's still coming up to God. And what God does is that he sends in his Holy Spirit to teach you and to correct your prayers. 
God listens to the Holy Spirit, not to you. He listens to the Holy Spirit through uh, inside you. And then the Holy Spirit, as you, he takes your prayer, translates it to the Father, and then the Lord Jesus Christ will take that red pen of that paper of all your requests and say, nope, 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 and then write the correction above. What he really meant, here's the correct thing to pray about, and then he'll write it down for you. And then the Lord, he can answer those things in mighty ways. So then, that's why it's important to offer prayers. If you don't offer the prayers, then the Holy Spirit can't take the words that you have and give it to the Father and Lord Jesus Christ corrects it for you. So that's not the greatest tragedy, unanswered prayer. It's unoffered prayers. So offer them. Well, it's going to be incorrect and wrong, and I'm scared, and I don't do anything right. Look, God understands. He loves you. He understands. So he says, don't worry, I got your back. What you mean to say is this, 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 and this. Look at Romans chapter 8. We'll look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession. Uh, for the saints according to the will of God. Now, look at this. This is what you can close with at verse 28. It is hard to have faith in prayers if, what if uh, God answers no, and I put all my faith into it? Should I put faith and then God answers yes? The faith that you should be putting into God is how he answers. Not yes, no, and wait and stuff like that. No, it's not one of those. It's how he answers. And that's what you should be putting faith on. Lord, uh, whatever's going on in this life, and these are things that happen in my life, which I can get a no, but I trust whatever you do with these prayers, you're going to give the best scenario. You will always do what's best. I trust you. I believe in that. I have faith that when I pray these requests, that you have the power yeah. to answer them, and you can make it come to pass the next day. And I also have, and my faith doesn't stop there, I also have faith that when you say no, or when these don't, things cannot happen, that you're going to still do what is best. That's real faith right there, however way he answers. Look at verse 28. You don't claim this, do you? And we know that what? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Notice that this famous passage that everything that happens in life, God's going to somehow work it for good. But in verse 28, it says, and, right? Mm -hmm. Why? It's tying to the previous context, that means. Mm -hmm. What's it tying? Verse 27. But verse 27 says, and, so that means it has to tie to the previous context. Yeah. Verse 26. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Yeah. And then what does God say? Because he understands you can't pray the way that you're supposed to pray. Just know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, isn't that encouraging? I hope you got encouraged by the answer, no. So hence, that's why that's the title. Bad news we hear quite often. Bad news, bad news, bad news to however way we pray. But you know those bad news actually turn out to be better news. Not good news, but better news of how God would turn it out. And that's why uh, you can't continue to insist your desires, your ways, and those yes prayers. You can't continue that way. You just have to trust God with that one. Yeah. So bad news, why I can't continue, says Gene Kim in his prayers. And I thank God for that. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers and encouraged us, Lord, and how you answer no to our prayers. May we believe in such a mighty and a great God. And may our prayer life become even more powerful and stronger than ever before. Thank you, Father, for answering my prayer no when I was absent for the past weeks, Lord. If you had answered yes, I would not have seen my people shine on the pulpit. And to see the fruit manifest, to see my people still being strong and supporting each other and not just supporting each other, but supporting their pastor at the same time. Usually the pastor supports the members, Lord, and I've lived that life for so many years. It's so good to be on the receiving end now, to be supported by the church. 
Thank you for answering no to my prayer. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for the past uh, weeks where I was absent, that you used it to something better. I was basically like the Apostle Paul, stuck in house prison, able to write an epistle. That Lord willing would be a blessing to others, and may the book on prayer help these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.